It's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, very special uh, panel conversation on the enduring mental health effects of human rights abuses. Um, this panel has been organized by the WSD Honda Center for uh, Human Rights and International Justice. And even though the Honda Center has been relatively new on campus, it's already had a major impact on uh, raising interest, scholarship, and action around human rights violations, international justice across the campus, really across uh, the whole Bay Area. I um, want to thank uh, David Cohn, the director, and of course Jesse Bruner for uh, the hard work in putting this uh, together and the sponsorship. There are also co-sponsors that I want to acknowledge. Um, the Center for Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Freeman Spogli Institute, the Center for Policy Outcomes and Prevention uh, in the Department of Pediatrics in the Medical School, and the Center for Innovation and Global Health, um, which is the global health lead in the medical school. Um, basically, clinicians and human rights workers are always the ultimate inheritors of a failed social order. Sooner or later, the breaking of bonds of collective peace, human rights, social justice, will ultimately wind up in the clinics, on the wards, in the morgues, and in the search for attribution, responsibility, and legal remedy. I don't have to tell this audience of the number of profound human catastrophes taking place around the world and the implications for uh, human rights, mental health, and international justice. Today we have a very special opportunity to confront this challenge um, with three uh, really remarkable um, panelists here to share their insights with us today. Um, the first will be Darren uh, Reicheter, um, who is Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Director of the Human Rights in Trauma Mental Health Laboratory here at Stanford. He's an expert in cross-cultural um, uh, mental health, uh, particularly as it relates to issues of torture and human rights violations. And he is an active consultant in a number of uh, areas of the world, including Cambodia, Haiti, Indonesia, and Zimbabwe. Our second speaker will be uh, Beth uh, von Skak, who is the Leah Kaplan Visiting Professor of Human Rights here at the Stanford Law School, um, and who's uh, been a leader in human rights law um, and extremely well known nationally and internationally, and currently serves as an advisor to the U.S. State Department's Office of Global uh, Criminal uh, Law, uh, Criminal Justice at the State Department, um, a, which has responsibility for formulating uh, U.S. policy as it relates to uh, crimes against humanity, uh, war crimes, and genocide. Our third speaker is Penelope, Penelope Mantile, uh, who is the Associate Director of the Honda Center, very well-known human rights lawyer, and has special responsibility for the um, Criminal Tribunal mon Tribunal's Monitoring Program at the Honda Center, and also is the point person for student engagement uh, with the Honda Center. Um, a remarkable set of activities where students can get involved, including internships at a number of overseas locations. So with this, I'll ask Darren to lead us off. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a little uh, story to kind of set up the laboratory. It's very difficult to explain what we're doing without knowing that this has been a 15 plus year process of, of working together in different areas and then kind of coming together about a year and a half ago to actually form what we now call a laboratory. So I'm going to reduce a hour long 
series of slides into a 10-minute introduction to our laboratory. Um, but I am going to tell a story. It's about a friend of mine named Sophony. This is a real story. Sophony was a dancer in Cambodia. And she was a school teacher there. Um, and the dance teacher, uh, before Pol Pot took power uh, in 1975, um, she taught little girls there. She spoke French. She was an educated person. She was married to a Mon Nol general, which is not a popular thing to be married to when Pol Pot comes into power. And most of you probably know, uh, about two million victims of genocide, which is largely what the documentation center of Cambodia focused on for many years, uh, until it started focusing also on the four million survivors and trying to tell the story, which is what mental health people might end up doing, or as Paul was sort of saying, or inheriting uh, the survivors, not the, not the deceased, and looking at the damages in a different way. There's a famous picture from uh, the Pol Pot uh, genocide, uh, uh, someone who was murdered at Tool Slime Prison, and this image will it'll be clear why I'm showing this image later. So, so the story goes, the little book says that Sophony, the Pol Pot came to power, and Sophony was left with nothing but her shadow. The Khmer Rouge turned Cambodia into a shadowland, and Sophony was forced to move far away. She did. She moved to San Jose and uh, became a mental health worker here in San Jose and worked with me um, at Gardner Clinic in San Jose treating uh, Khmer Rouge survivors. So, why'd she become a mental health person? Well, because their psychiatric outcomes are very, very common in post-conflict settings. Uh, I don't know if anyone in the room is from uh, a medical discipline or from a psychiatric or mental health discipline. This is such an obvious thing to people that are in mental health, yet it's not always totally obvious to people that are thinking about transitional justice. It's alluded to very often in transitional justice systems, but never broken down, quantified in the way that psychiatrists and scientists in mental health might think about it. Common disorders that we would see, anxiety disorders, mood disorders, somatoform disorders, substance use disorders, the list goes on. Um, the most sort of popular version of a disorder that you might think about after a conflict event is actually not the most common, but it's the most popular, and that's post-traumatic stress disorder, and that's a very sort of specific possible outcome after a traumatic event or human rights violation that is seen, obviously, in high prevalence after a conflict kind of situation. But it's not the only kind of thing that can happen after, after a traumatic event. So this is on the in individual level, right? This is when, as Paul was sort of saying, in a clinic, when we're sort of seeing a human being in front of us and we're sort of saying, why are you here? And, and they're talking about this. But think back on that slide about the genocide survivors. Four million people who were all exposed to some form of human rights violation. Broad spectrum, but many of them forced to do things and see things that were quite uh, horrible. Then you're starting to talk about population data, right? You're starting to talk about um, massive effects of massive trauma on more than individuals, but um, big populations. And from my perspective as mental health professionals, it's very obvious and these statistics um, are often quite clear and well recorded and the epidemiology is, is, is very well written, but that's not always known uh, in other disciplines. So Beth and I worked with the documentation center of Cambodia uh, and, and worked on this book about the mental health outcomes uh, in Cambodia after Pol Pot. And the reason, the main reason uh, that we worked on this book was to try to affect change in the mental health system there in Cambodia. Um, sort of say, listen, you know, there's a much bigger problem based on these statistics than what the mental health, uh, public mental health is set up to, to deal with. And almost everybody that we interviewed and worked with who co-wrote the book, the local psychiatrists and mental health professionals completely agreed. In fact, we kind of let them guide how the book was written and, in fact, do most of the writing. Um, and they were in 100% agreement, um, but 
pushing back on the mental health, the public mental health system was very difficult because they said, yeah, we, we are aware that there's all these problems, but there's, there's no advocacy for it, there's no money for it. No mistake, we coincided the book with the Khmer Rouge uh, Tribunal, or the ECCC. Um, this trial happening over the last five years, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that, but we purposefully um, had the book sort of coincide with that because we thought the advocacy would be more powerful um, in parallel with the justice system. Here's my friend Sophony on the cover of Stanford uh, Medicine. Uh, she was asked, can serving justice cure PTSD? Which is not really the question that we're asking. Uh, I think it was a catchy little hook to get people to read it, but, um, but her story was highlighted in Stanford Medicine because of what I'm about to tell you. This court became really the first court to hear about mental health statistics as evidence in, the, in a major tribunal that had to do with human rights. Even other tribunals that were happening around the same time, Sierra Leone, um, Rwanda, or former Yugoslavia, did not specifically hear about mental health and use mental health statistics the way that the, the ECCC did. Um, and so Sophony actually became somebody to testify not only about her personal story of surviving, but also about the mental health outcomes that she experienced as a professional when she came to the United States. Her testimony was followed by the testimony of a psychiatrist who is sort of a national figure in Cambodia. His name is Sotira Chim, and he spoke specifically about the epidemiology behind psychiatry and used our book was submitted as evidence, and mm -hmm. he used the statistics from this book to kind of uh, emphasize that these aren't his theories or personal beliefs, but he's extrapolating them from the literature that's known about trauma and about Cambodia. Not surprisingly, the top Khmer Rouge leaders found guilty of crimes against humanity, and their sentence was life in prison. What was surprising for me and for a lot of the attorneys that were involved, and for my lab, was that um, the psych some of the language that we had introduced to this court through our advocacy actually ended up in the decision. Uh, quite frankly, some of it was copy-pasted into the decision, apparently, because it was exactly what we had written. We're um, not and, suing, by the way. Right, and, and, and I make this joke, right, it's the, the happiest I've ever been to be plagiarized was right at that moment when we read this decision and said, my goodness, that's what we said, that's what we wrote. Um, and I'll show you, so, so when the damage part came out, there's a 700 page decision, and then the damage part, they said the chamber finds, blah, 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 blah. Civil parties, a very large number of additional victims have suffered from immeasurable harm, including physical th suffering, which is usually the thing that's highlighted. But they also put loss of dignity, which is our term that we kind of coined a little bit, psychological trauma, obviously the focus of the work that we're doing, and grief arising from family members and close relations. But, the fact that they entered this, we were very enthusiastic. Wow, they acknowledged the mental health part and thought about that. Keep turning the pages of this 700-page uh, decision, and it turns out that they, the court, um, were very interested in and supported awarding money toward the treatment of mental health survivors, right? And that's all well and good for the Khmer Rouge Tribunal to say We've earmarked some money, you really ought to pay it, but this was good money, this was money that was actually um, uh, pre-created. Um, um, it, was, it was already there, so they were ordering money that was real money to be actually used for the treatment of survivors. Uh, which, is, which is, we would have been happy with a the theoretical gesture, but to actually have real money awarded to real clinicians is even better. So this occurred Beth and I finished this book in 2010. It was published in 2011. Um, it had its impact in about 2012. The court decision was 2013. And then we started wondering, well, you know, this, this has more potential than just one place and one time. It has the potential to be used somewhere beyond Cambodia and the ECCC because, you know, in most conflict settings, we're going to find very high rates of PTSD. We're going to have high rates of other bad mental health outcomes. 
And to the extent that there are good epidemiological studies, this can be used in different court processes. So we started talking to courts, and Beth uh, had uh, lots of connections at the um, International Criminal Court and helped me to go there and sort of have this dialogue with them about which parts of criminal cases this might be used in. And they said all of the above. But really in the damage hearing is where it would be most valuable to the prosecution. The prosecution. But where would it be the most valuable to the victims? Probably in the reparations part. But they said you, your epidemiology can help in, impact each part of a prosecution of a criminal case. Thus was born the Human Rights and Trauma Mental Health Laboratory, which is a Stanford mouthful. <laughs> 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 We're still looking for a better acronym or like a good we welcome, we welcome <laughs> contributions. The, the ones I've got have actually been quite funny, but um, not great. Basically, a human rights uh, laboratory that really looks at exactly what we're talking about in this case, using the mental health realities, the science behind the mental health to inform courts in an effort to serve survivors of mental health, bad mental health outcomes. And with that notion, there's a lot more application than just the report writing that I've talked about, but I'm gonna stick on that for a minute. We decided to collaborate with the International Criminal Court um, and you can see the slide there, sort of, you can imagine they have a lot of different cases that you can, in your mind, apply what we're talking about to those cases. This is a case that they chose to actually apply our method, and the prosecutors from the International Court came out to Stanford and had, a, had an extensive visit with us, and basically asked us for a report on this case. Why this case uh, was so attractive to us is not because of the specifics here, but because so much evidence was actually gathered there. The survivors of rapes in the villages had actually gone to a university psychiatrist and had surveys completed where, and he actually asked them the symptoms of PTSD to see if they had it or not. So he had a little study that's still unpublished, but he had all that data available to the court and for, to inform our report. So we wrote a report, and that report is complete now, um, and it is exactly similar to this, only instead of a whole book about the whole mental health system and, and everything else, it's, I don't know how many, 300 pages, it's a 30-page report that basically says the, the salient points that uh, Beth and I put into this book, the salient points of what happened, what that causes, why it's bad, and why it's relevant to a court process. And you can sort of read the uh, um, specifics on that. It demonstrates the link between the crime and the outcomes. And it also s explains that the outcomes are not surprising, right? So when they were out here, they talked about another case, and they sort of said, well, you know, there's other cases that we see, like this one, where, you know, there was um, sexual enslavement and rape. Do you think that might have caused any kind of bad psychiatric outcomes, right? And we're like, I mean, almost certainly, but what kind, of, what kind of data do you have? And in this case, they really didn't have much data. So we said, well, we could write a report about what that tends to do. But your Central African Republic case, we can write a report about what this tends to do, the science that we know, and also about 500 women who were real survivors who we have data on. So what happened to Sophie? Well, she actually moved to San Jose, and as I said, she became the only uh, American survivor to testify at the ECCC. Um, she still runs a dance company down in San Jose in parallel with her job as a mental health director. Uh, and she teaches kids still. So I wrote a children's book about it that just came out. <laughs> and this is my favorite slide because it's the number one release <laughs> in children's Asian history. <laughs> I think there's like three books on all together. Mine was number one, so I was very excited. Um, but that's not a little story behind our laboratory. Now our laboratory is actually going, and, uh, and man, we've had a lot of 
very exciting possibility. So we are <coughs> looking at this one case, and we're waiting for a verdict, which will come next month. If if this uh, if Bemba is found guilty, they will ask for our testimony in, in addition to the report, which they already have in hand. Um, other ICC collaborations, totally possible. Other courts have approached us and kind of talked about the idea of using um, our material. Um, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal is having another phase wherein we are consolidating this book into a specific report, and that report will be completed this month um, for the civil party attorneys at the end of this month. Um, what about U.S. courts? Uh, well, we're going to hear about that from penalty right in one minute. Um, the other thing that we're going to talk about a little bit, if we have time, is immigration courts and how they can use uh, mental health outcomes for safe resettlement um, of refugees uh, in the world. Uh, so our lab has done a similar project that is not about report writing, but about case-by-case -case basis, where we're able to help women who were targets of ongoing rape uh, get paroled out of Haiti and into a safe place where they not only would not be raped, but they would be uh, eligible and receive mental health treatment for PTSD. So I'm going to be quiet. I think I took an hour and turned it into 15 minutes, so that's pretty good. And I'll let maybe Beth go yeah. from there. Can we go to your Bemba slide? Just yeah. Because I thought okay. I'd talk a little bit more about it. <coughs> so I thought I'd talk a little bit about the case against uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba. It's from the central, actually from the Democratic Republic of Congo, although he has been indicted for crimes committed in the neighboring Central African Republic. And speak a little bit about the legal framework that enabled our work to potentially be influential, and I can give a little bit of a sense of the procedural posture of that case and where our work would ultimately fit in. So Bemba, um, the Central African Republic has been in the news quite a bit recently, but the crimes that he is associated with were committed during an earlier rebellion. He was the head of essentially a mercenary group, a group, a group of militia, who was called in by the then president of the Central African Republic to help quell a rebellion that was happening within the Central African Republic. Republic. So his troops were working alongside the national troops of the CAR to put down this coup attempt. And he, he had basically convened a number of mercenaries and really didn't have much in the way of funds in which to pay them for their work. And so part of the theory of the case against him is that he essentially told his subordinates, listen, take whatever you want. You know, go in, quell this rebellion, whatever you see there is yours. And so the charges that have arisen out of that, um, of that directive basically relate to a, a pillage, murder, and the mass rape of women, um, men, and children in the particular regions where his, his troops were deployed. And so um, the Central African Republic had ratified the International Criminal Court statute in 2001, which was very soon after it was um, it entered into force. And these crimes began happening a year later. And so the crimes against Bemba concerned 2002 and 2003. Um, they, the Central African Republic referred itself to the ICC, which is to say something has to trigger an investigation. Either the Security Council has to initiate an investigation, or a state has to refer a situation to the court to initiate an investigation, or the Security Council um, can do it or, or sorry, or the prosecutor can do it his, his or herself, but in this case now it's a woman, so herself. In the end, the Central African Republic referred itself to the court and said, we can't handle these this crimes, we can't handle this situation, please will you start initiating investigations and prosecutions, and so the court did, um, ultimately in 2007. Trial began against Jean-Pierre Bemba in 2010, and closing statements were issued in 2014. So the court has now had this case under consideration uh, for two years. And the, the judgment has been announced and the judgment will be issued toward the end of March. So we are looking forward to that moment. Over 5,000 victims were granted uh, victim status before the court. This is a unique feature of the ICC that is also shared by the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. Basically, victims can constitute themselves as what are called civil parties, which give them certain procedural rights in the criminal process, which they wouldn't otherwise enjoy. Normally, for example, in our system, victims appear as witnesses for the prosecution. They don't have an independent basis in which to um, question witnesses, to put forward their own witnesses, to cross-examine the defendant. The, the two tribunals, the ECCC and the ICC, have been experimenting with giving victims greater status within the criminal process. 
Um, the status is much stronger on paper than it has been in practice, and there's been a general retrenchment of those procedural rights as these courts have gotten going, and Penelope has studied this extensively, and we can talk about it if people are interested. Um, it's, it's difficult to think about how you integrate victims of a mass atrocity situation. For example, the Bemba case, 5,000 individuals have put forward a petition to appear as civil parties. Right? It's unmanageable if you imagine each one of those individuals getting some sort of procedural rights, um, independent and autonomous of the, the prosecution. And so the courts have really struggled, kind of in real time, with making these procedural rights that live on paper a reality in the, within the confines of a tribunal with limited resources. Um, interestingly enough, Bemba has not been declared indigent. He had assets um, in Europe. And many of the European, all, in fact, at this point, all of the European states are members of the ICC. So if the ICC gives an order, they're bound to apply to, to comply with that order by virtue of their treaty obligations. So he had many uh, assets in Portugal. So those assets have been frozen. He's allowed a monthly stipend with which to support his family and also pay for his legal defense. And so um, those funds will eventually be available for reparations <coughs> in the event that he is convicted and a reparations order is, um, is given. Now, the way the, the, the court has it under submission on the merits, if he is found guilty and, and convicted, then there will be a sentencing phase and then a reparations phase. And this is another way in which the ICC and the ECCC are unique in terms of international criminal tribunals. They have particular provisions allowing for the payment of reparations. In the ECCC situation context, the text itself in the constitutive document is much more limited. It envisions only moral and symbolic reparations. However, as Darren mentioned, um, in the context of the first cases to go forward before that court, um, the court ruled that if funds were pre-pledged or were made available, they could be used for various reparations projects. And in the end, um, a, a American diplomat was charged with fundraising for the ECCC and included within his work fundraising around the creation of a pot of funds that could be used for the payment of reparations on behalf of victims. And so there was this pot of money, and as Darren mentioned, some of that has gone towards psychosocial rehabilitation of victims. The ICC is slightly different. There is a separate entity called the Trust Fund for Victims. It was created by the same treaty that created the ICC, but it's a separate body. It has its own budget. It has its own management, oversight, et cetera. Um, that entity is engaged in ICC situation countries in two capacities. It has an assistance mandate, and then it has a reparations mandate. So at the moment, it's engaged in its assistance mandate, which is to say it's using money that has been voluntarily given to it to create projects on behalf of victims. Many of them relate to psychosocial rehabilitation of victims. There's also um, the provision of, of medical assistance, prostheses, there has been, as you have maybe studied in Central Africa and Western Africa, um, a tendency to um, lock people's hands off, lock people's legs off as part of the um, effort to undermine um, opposition populations. And so these individuals have been given prostheses so that they can continue to work, job training, education, et cetera. So the Trust Fund for Victims was about to launch itself in the Central African Republic when the most recent rebellion happened, um, the Seleka Rebellion, the Seleka Alliance, which is redundant, but anyway, Seleka means alliance, but we still so call it the Seleka Alliance, um, emerged and started to challenge the constitutional order. And then we had the anti balaka forces that emerged to fight against the Seleka Alliance, and the uh, internal armed conflict existed between those two non-state actors. The ICC has since opened a second investigation with regard to that rebellion. That's separate from the charges against Bemba. So what has Bemba been charged with? He's been charged with counts of crimes against humanity and war crimes, including pillage, murder, and mass rape. And what our brief does, and our brief will not be relevant until we have a judgment against him, until there's a verdict against him, and then we would move into this sentencing phase and this reparations phase. And our brief, um, the goal of the brief is to speak to both of those phases. A, to show that sentencing should be um, severe in light of the severity of the harm committed to these particular populations. Um, and also that the victim community should be entitled to reparations that should be paid out of this trust fund for victims. And what our, what our brief tried to do, there was evidence, as Darren mentioned, in the record from Dr. Tabo, who had been a treating physician and who had had the presence of mind to create a survey instrument and to gather data from 
women who had presented themselves at Bangui Hospital um, in the Central African Republic. And what he found were astronomical rates of rape, and not just rape as rape, but rape in front of family members, individuals who were forced to rape each other, rape in public, gang rapes. So these are not rapes for the purpose of um, you know, war booty, let's say, or rapes for the purpose of relieving the stress of battle, you know, some of the sort of theories that have been articulated in the past about the pre prevalence of mass rape in situations of armed conflicts. These rapes were clearly conducted as a way to terrorize the local population, to undermine their dignity, to destroy them on the theory that they were supportive of the opposition regime. And so that was a way to destroy support for the opposition of um, the, the, the current president and Bemba's forces. And so what our brief does is look at the data that has, was gathered around um, the Central African Republic and situate it in the larger literature around the existence of mass rape and the harm that it occurs, the physical and psychological sequelae of rape, but also mass rape, gang rape, rape with physical harm, et cetera. And so we present all of that literature to the court. Um, so we're waiting to hear for, from a verdict. If we get the verdict, then uh, the prosecutor plans to petition to have um, Darren appear as an expert witness. We would submit this brief in connection with his, um, with his testimony. One thing that's unique about this case, and which I think is why it's taken the court so long to rule, is it will be the first case that the ICC has had to rule on the, the doctrine of superior responsibility, which is this theory that says, even if you are not directly responsible for committing abuses, if your subordinates committed abuses, they were under your effective control, you knew or should have known that they were committing these abuses, and you failed to intervene to either prevent them in advance or to punish them after the fact, you can be held liable. This is the first case that will test the applicability of that theory before the ICC. So that's my, partially my theory as to why it's taking them so long to rule. It would be very interesting from a jurisprudential perspective for that to come. So, be on the lookout on March 21st, I think it is. Um, there should be some coverage of that. Um, I'll be blogging about it. I'm sure the Honda Center will blog about it as well. And so we'll be able to push out some data about that case. So I'll pause there, let um, Penelope talk about one of our other projects, but I'm happy to talk more about this case if you're interested. So I think I've been left with two of our other projects. Yes. <laughs> but I'll, I'll do one. Yes, I do. Um, so I only have an image for solitary confinement stuff, but I thought I'd put that up. So, um, yeah, so as Darren introduced, our lab focuses on uh, the legal applications for a specific area of psychiatric research. Um, so for mental health effects of human rights abuses. And Beth and Darren have given you um, a good overview of sort of the two core projects of one area of what the lab does, which is um, producing expert reports for use in international criminal proceedings to bring psychiatric research into that legal arena. But there's other legal arenas where we are also working to bring the same uh, psychiatric research um, and, uh, and improve, improve outcomes. So the two areas that um, are, are other wings um, would be <coughs> refugee resettlement um, and the new area, which uh, I'm sort of introducing as a ex very new, within a few weeks and we're still really discussing how we're gonna approach it, um, is closer to home in California and that's um, the mental health outcomes of long-term solitary confinement. Um, so um, I'll just give a quick blurb on the refugee resettlement and not go deep into it, but um, the, the refugee uh, resettlement, we were formerly calling humanitarian parole project because humanitarian parole is one legal remedy that's available um, for uh, refugees to find resettlement, but traditionally um, humanitarian parole was offered for people with, um, with physical medical um, issues. So this, the quintessential case would be like a baby born in Guatemala with a really rare cardiac condition who can only seek treatment at the Mayo Clinic. And uh, the US might grant them a special immigration status to c travel to the United States and stay in the United States during that treatment and be here um, with the idea that they could return. Um, in post-earthquake Haiti, Darren um, worked with a, a number of lawyers and other clinicians um, to test whether um, the same avenue could be used for seeking mental health treatment for traumatized um, populations 
in that case, it was victims of sexual and gender-based violence in post-earthquake Haiti, where there's a complete breakdown of governance and rule of law because the whole country has literally collapsed. Um, and in fact, they were very successful in um, seeking resettlement for um, cases where they could show PTSD um, and treatment needed to be sought outside of, of post-earthquake Haiti. The lab is now um, still working with some of the same partners to test um, whether this same approach uh, works in other scenarios, or is it unique to post-earthquake Haiti that we were so successful. Um, so the cases that we're now working with, and Darren, as Darren says, this would be a much interesting presentation. Two weeks. In two weeks. Yeah. He's about to go to Jordan, travel to Jordan, because we're working um, on Syrian refugee, primarily Syrian refugee cases in Jordan. Um, so that'll be my. And right here is Michelle Berry. She's the, um, <laughs> she's the dean of the medical school. She's coming with no, me. No, dean of global health. <laughs> no, but dean, of, <laughs> dean of global health. The point is that she's not a psychiatrist. She is she is an infectious disease. Uh, internal medicine doctor, and so she's actually going to be looking at the opportunity to potentially use psych medical and also psychiatric mechanisms to do a similar project. Um, and so this project, again, I think in two weeks we'll have another lecture here and we can explain what we, what we come up with. Um, so the third area that I mentioned um, is the mental health um, effects of long-term solitary confinement. This project um, has sort of come onto our plate thanks to a recently settled class action lawsuit um, in California. Uh, Ashker or Oshker? Ashker. Mm -hmm. Ashker versus California, um, uh, where we see an exciting opportunity to undertake important research um, and, and possibly policy advocacy, but we're still sort of feeling out what's the best way for our lab to approach this because. The, um, the type of work that we would be doing is slightly different than what we've done in, um, in the refugee resettlement cases and in the international criminal court cases, where we're mostly sort of marshalling the evidence from the psychiatric literature and presenting it to lawyers and judges in a way that they can understand and absorb into those proceedings and into that um, jurisprudence or, um, or those uh, refugee outcomes. Um, the solitary confinement case, um, we're, we're more looking at how either we can be produce research that's helpful for future litigation um, on solitary confinement because the, the jurisprudence still does not state that solitary confinement is per se unconstitutional um, under the Eighth Amendment, um, cruel and unusual punishment. But the Ashker case got um, a, a really significant settlement um, to, to release a lot of people from long-term solitary confinement and to end indefinite solitary confinement in California. So I just wanted to give you a little quickie overview of, um, of Ashker um, and then open it to discussion because that'll sort of give you the rundown. So this is a photo of um, a prisoner in what's called um, uh, secure housing unit, so SHU is the shorthand for it. Um, Solitary Wash Orange is the new black belt. Right. <laughs> um, uh, in Pelican Bay, which is um, a maximum security prison way north in California, nearly on the Oregon border. Um, and it's a sort of notorious prison. It's been the subject of a number of class action lawsuits for not just solitary confinement, but all sorts of um, treatment and condition of prisoners' issues. Um, so at the start of the case, which was 2009, I think, when they filed, um, uh, there was, I think, 4,200 uh, prisoners in, so in se segregated confinement. 3,000 of these were facing indefinite sentence in solitary, um, and this was often based on allegations of gang involvement. So this was not um, the person already facing a life sentence who then committed a murder in prison and needed sort of additional punishment for it. A lot of this was indefinite um, sentence based on gang or alleged gang ties. Um, in 2012, the named uh, plaintiff, Todd Ashker, um, was among 78 prisoners confined in Pelican Bay's isolation unit, of which this is an example. This is not him, but this is an example of the unit. Um, for more than 20 years, he'd been in solitary confinement. There were 78 of them that had been there for over two decades. Um, more than 500 of them had been in the unit for more than 10 years at the time of the lawsuit. Um, and. Uh, and at this time now, SHU prisoners are being released into the general population if, uh, if they aren't in solitary confinement for a specific crime, such as assault or murder. Um, and even if they are in solitary for a specific um, crime, the settlement 
should end the use of shoe for indefinite sentences. So the solitary can be used as punishment, but only when a defined sentence um, and no more than five years. Um, so the Department of Corrections has agreed that uh, prisoners who remain in the shoe or you know, one of those um, terms, uh, if they've been there for 10 years or more, um, are, should be put in a special unit with some sort of personal um, interaction. There is a disagreement with the Department of Corrections as to whether this constitutes solitary confinement because they interact with guards through, you can kind of see in the image, this is a photo taken through a grate. You can see it's sort of the shadow. Um, there's some interaction with guards. And they can yell through the walls. They can yell through the, they can hear each other through the walls a little bit. Um, uh, so there are 62 inmates as of July that remain in SHU who have been there for over 10 years. Um, but they should get some educational programming and some recreation if they remain in SHU. However, the settlement um, did not um, allow for or create any programs for those who are released from SHU into the general prison population or released on parole in, uh, into the general into the world. <laughs> um, and that's an area where we see perhaps um, some research or work from the lab could help inform programming like that to be useful because not a lot is known about um, what are the long-term uh, mental health outcomes for people who have been in this kind of confinement for such extended periods of time. As we've been discussing this, um, we've been talking about uh, ways to approach this and, and whether there's any sort of proxy populations you can look at, um, you know, prisoners of war, and, but it's really hard to find um, an analogy <laughs> um, or a group that they can compare this to. So, um, so yeah, as a lab, we're sort of discussing how we want to approach uh, research on this topic, where we can fit in, what we can feasibly do, um, and we'd like to help, just like with our other projects, produce insight that can be useful um, to the justice process um, and to sort of making our justice processes more humane um, and, uh, and perhaps contribute to um, more insightful future jurisprudence about um, what is the harm here, what are the remedies that should be available through the law, um, and does this constitute cruel and unusual punishment? Because one of the things we've heard uh, from this litigation and from earlier litigation um, is that uh, when talking about the mental health impacts of this, there's a real focus on raving, stark raving madness, and sort of when lawyers talk about this, we think of what psychiatrists think of as acute psychosis. Um, and, and there's a language problem, and, and language is, is, you know, that's the whole ballgame in the law, I think. Um, and so, uh, but, but as, as Darren and others point out in our lab discussions, um, acute psychosis is, not, is only the beginning of the discussion on um, sort of mental health impacts, um, and we need to understand more, and we need to describe better what are the, the impacts on people who have been um, in these conditions, um, and what should their rights be, and what, what sort of programs should we as a community, as California, as the United States, make available um, to, to support uh, good mental health. And one anecdote we heard just on your last point was uh, one of the individuals who've been released can't eat food with anyone else in the room with them. Yeah. So there's no acute psychosis there, he literally can't eat food in a common social environment. Mm -hmm. He has to be in a separate place to eat food. I mean, that comes from having eaten food alone for how many years while in the shoe. Um, and these cases are historically very different, difficult to challenge solitary confinement because the issue often is mooted. Um, if it becomes challenged, then the authorities will release the individual back into the general population. You may have heard recently about the Wood Fox case. This was a case that we reached out to the lawyers to see if we could be helpful. The timing was not good. If they were really in need of, um, if we were going to do a brief in sort of the next week or so. Um, they've recently settled their case and their, their um, client has been actually fully released um, into the into general religion. After serving a 40 year sentence, a good chunk of that was in solitary confinement. In Louisiana. In Louisiana, that's right. Oh, and one other image I wanted to show is this is the uh, recreation yard at Pelican Bay. So for all but 90 minutes a day, the prisoners in SHU are in their room, their windowless room with the grate that the image was through. And then for 90 minutes on their own, they're released into this room, for which has filtered light through the ceiling uh, for recreation. So that's, the, that's what the reality of solitary looked like for somebody who's there for 20 years. Well, great. Well, I want to thank the panelists for a remarkable set of insights on activities from Cambodia to the Central African Republic and the Republic of Bay. Mm -hmm.
It's now time for questions, answers, comments from all of you. Now, hi, I'm Mark Lucia. I'm affiliated as a visiting scholar with Panda this semester. Um, a quick question for um, each of you, I think. First, Penelope, is it possible to conceive solitary confinement on a long term basis as the international crime of torture to make international criminal law relevant here? Um, a question for Darren. Um, why the focus on PTSD when you started at the outset by saying this was not the most common of the various kinds of serious psychiatric disorders? Is that only because everyone knows what that is or because it's more severe than the other forms of it? And then for Beth, um, Darren mentioned that um, there's mental health data that's relevant to each part of the criminal trial prosecution. Now, most criminal lawyers, uh, and, cer and certainly um, defense lawyers, would be intensely skeptical of that. It, which resonates with Hannah Arendt's critique of the Eichmann trial, which introduced victim testimony at, on the liability stage, and, and it had been almost universally rejected by the international jurisprudence on this. So why is this any different? Why shouldn't we be just as skeptical? Um, and then also for you, uh, the severity of the harm relevant to sentencing uh, and the victim uh, testimony with respect to that. Now, at the domestic level, this is intensely controversial. Yeah, on the victim same. impact statements. Yeah, okay. that's right, victim impact statements. So is there really any argument for distinguishing uh, the use of this testimony in international criminal law rather than domestic? Sure. Yeah, so uh, what I would say is in the reports that we're writing, the, there is no emphasis on PTSD. Maybe PTSD is the most exaggerated statistic, but that there is no specific interest. We we we, were, we kind of term, coined the term um, trauma-related mental health outcome. It's not so it's a, again a mouthful of words, but I mean it's better than PTSD because PTSD is is a narrow possible outcome. With regard to the refugee resettlement, I would say almost 100% of the cases that we get have PTSD. They've been sort of cherry picked by attorneys because they, they are using a diagnosis that 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 is specific to it's the only really one of the only diagnoses in the DSM where the mental health issue has to come from a traumatic event. So they're sort of they're using that cause in their argument. This woman has PTSD because she was raped. She's at risk for being raped again. She needs to get out of here. She needs treatment for this thing. Rather than she, she probably has depression related to what happened after the earthquake, and it's pretty severe. She, she needs to get out of here. It's a, it's a, it's a more straightforward argument for those attorneys. But in, in the cases, in the reports that we're writing, we are including all mental health outcomes. And I'd say PTSD may be the most obvious or the most. Um, there may be more literature produced on PTSD than other mental health disorders, but we we use all of the. Other. So in terms of your first question, so in the trial proceedings below, there were two experts who were um, you know, get allowed to give expert testimony. And for the non-lawyers in the room, that's significant because what that means is they can testify as to their opinions. And they can bring in a lot of data that isn't relevant to the material elements of each crime necessarily. Um, and it doesn't have to be eyewitness testimony necessarily. They can speak to their opinions, they can bring literature in, et cetera. Um, and the ICC, as you know, and you know others may not know, is, is based on somewhat of a civil law evidentiary model. So in a common law system, if you have you know, watched you know, TV and you know, this and that, they're always making objections about the admissibility of evidence and this and that. In a civil law system, a lot of evidence comes in and it all goes to weight. How much weight does the judge give to a particular piece of evidence? So there's a much more free entry of evidence. So that's the tradition that the ICC has very much adopted. So we had testimony from Dr. Tavo, who was, was both an eyewitness um, to the harm of women, and then also was able to package his survey results as somewhat of an expert report. And then there was a doctor from Bellevue Hospital, a torture treatment center in Bellevue Hospital, who also gave some testimony about um, not just the individualized impact of rape on the victim, but also the longitudinal impact, the impact on her family, on her community, et cetera. So in some ways, very similar to the brief that we are, are suggesting. I anticipate that we will be challenged um, if and when we want to put our brief forward at the sentencing and or reparations phase by the defendant's counsel. And so the prosecutor will just have to litigate that and they'll have to decide how much resources they want to put towards getting Darren in front of the court. Um, and so it, this, this is the first for the ICC and so it will be very much, I'm curious to see how it will, how it will go. Um, in terms of your point about you know, victims and victim impact statements, you're absolutely right that in the domestic system, 
it's been quite controversial, the idea of allowing the victims to testify as to the long-term impact of a criminal act on them. Theory being, it's prejudicial towards the defendant, it might sway the jury, um, the jury might act not on the basis of evidence in the record, but on compassion or empathy towards the particular victim. And so some courts have put limits on the ability of victims to put these so-called victim impact statements into evidence. As far as I know, maybe you know differently, I don't think there's ever been a ruling in international criminal law on this question, and those um, jurisprudential and almost even philosophical debates that we've been struggling with haven't percolated up to the international level. It may do that eventually. The courts I have found, in my experience, have been somewhat, in some cases, have been resistant to allowing expert testimony around statistics, for example. And if people are familiar with the Human Rights Data Analysis Group in San Francisco, Patrick Ball has often done talks here on campus, um, he had a really hard time in one of the cases trying to put some of his statistical evidence in front of the court, and the court was like, oh, this is all confusing, we don't get it, it's like numbers, weird, we're not used to this, and so basically rejected most of his conclusions, which he was trying to show that the violence in question was not random. Like it had to be, given the statistical correlations and et cetera, it had to be because of a plan or policy. Who that plan or policy originated in was an open question, but it was not random. It was not people plucked at random. It was clearly done on ethnic okay, grounds. The legal order. relevance of that is clear. No one would the legal relevance of that is clear, right? It's somewhat different in this victim. I, do, I just want to make sure yeah. we have enough time. These are absolutely Great important. questions. No. The answer uh, is I don't points. know. The court hasn't ruled yet. We'll see. But I, I just want to make sure. <laughs> um, yeah, Penelope, sorry. Yeah, we won't settle this here. I think. <laughs> please, please. No, it's extremely helpful. Thank you. And on torture, yes, I think there is a possible avenue for, for making the case there. Um, I think uh, the order of operations in sort of the lab lineup is is uh, finding out the information about what's the nature of the harm, um, and then seeing all the different fora where that could be used, right? So in policy advocacy for programming in the California Department of Corrections, um, you know, in future jurisprudence, where I think in US courts we tended to like our homegrown words more than, yeah. <laughs> um, but certainly I think there is, there's compelling jurisprudence from the European um, Court of Human Rights. Um, and uh, and yeah, I think that in looking at the, the language that's used there, um, we'll see what our findings can slide. Thank you. Please. Um, so I'm wondering about um, some of the challenges of translating medical findings into mm -hmm. legal uh, language. I know that in the domestic court system, there's often a challenge in the context of establishing causality between an event and um, outcomes, and I think especially with mental health, it's even uh, more difficult. And with situations where there's been a significant passage of time, it might even be more challenging. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit about uh, that. And my second question is on um, the broader role of reparations. So I know there's some literature talking about how reparations can also have um, a symbolic value to victims. So beyond like getting money that can be used for treatment, um, it can also have um, you know meaning um, in rehabilitation, um, just as the sense of getting acknowledgement and, and uh, rebuilding of, of uh, you know loss of dignity and things like that. So I'm wondering if that in some way plays out uh, in in the book and in the um, in your uh, report. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that, um, so it's kind of back to the question that was asked earlier. One of the reasons why PTSD is, is one of the hallmarks that we're using in these cases is because there's the cause. So in other words, if somebody has some other mental health outcomes, um, I don't want to, I think we have to be respectful of time, but I mean, there's a book um, that's about the Jewish Holocaust and the existential losses that people experienced after the Jewish Holocaust, and there's a psychodynamic psychotherapist who, like, that was his area of work. Never once in the book does he talk about PTSD. In fact, when he wrote the book, that term didn't exist. And he's talking about he's talking about these very real losses that are difficult to quantify. PTSD is much more easy to quantify, so it's to, to study and to show. When we write a report, we we write the statistics that we can about PTSD, and also comment on everything else that we can. We allude to Victor Frankl and say, you know, his work is relevant, it's just it's harder to measure the existential reality that somebody might have from that. 
as to you know go into court and be able to say the the the, the rate of the prevalence of PTSD in a non-traumatized population is under two percent, and in this population it's fifty percent. Like that's very very clear and hard for them. Our reports are sophisticated though, and we bring into bring into these other things. And then I think also that also alludes to the other question that you asked. Yeah, um, the, you know, money for mental health treatment is great. Two one million dollar projects that were specifically about treatment. That was fantastic. But I, I, I'm not sure how much fantastic literature there is, but I think that everybody that's involved with this um, process believes that there is some some healing to the whole process of transitional justice and to the recognition of, and not necessarily specific monies going toward uh, the mental health part of it. So, in fact, in the in in our next version of this book that's coming out this year, um, there's some there's some more information about that. But not, there's not hard and excellent facts about it. There's theoretical material about that so far. The Inter-American Court has been really at the lead yeah. on coming up with symbolic reparations orders, um, doing things like naming of a school or or a you know a park or a street on the you know with respect to the victims or. Um, having the state acknowledge, take responsibility for, that has a symbolic value, even if there's no monetary reparations that flows from that necessarily, although the Inter-American Court has been pretty good about also getting money damages for the victims. The ECCC in its first reparations order was it felt itself limited because of its text, and it didn't have this pot of money available. So they ruled that the naming of the victims in the judgment was a form of symbolic reparation, which rang, I think, a little hollow to victims who were expecting a little bit more than that. Um, and so that's why this effort to come up with a pot of money that they could then use for more, um, for more concrete reparations was important. I think many people are skeptical of the idea of writing an individualized check to someone. I think there is this sense that we should look at healing entire communities, look at how collective reparations can work rather than just writing a check and calling it a day. Good. Uh, just a quick one. Um, I did research, field research in Rwanda 10, uh, 10 years ago and um, our research is identified in the justice system in Rwanda. And uh, when I returned, and naturally I think I was, I was traumatized. And when I returned to Zambia, where I'm from, my mother's sister uh, from the village, uh, when she heard where I had been for three months, uh, gave me some medicine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, made of roots, natural um, uh, you know, products, organic products. And she had told me what to do with them, how to bathe in them, yeah, for a certain period of time and in a particular way. And she explained that this would, right, remove the death from mm -hmm. from me, that I carried that from Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is, we've had so many mental health workers uh, in Cambodia, uh, in Rwanda, in Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. Central African Republic, uh, the movement from the West, right, mm -hmm. um, to the global South. And do you see, um, since the 1990s, when these investigations really began, uh, do you see, us in the West, um, across sort of pollination, uh, adopting some of these um, responses to mental health, um, you know, indigenous, um, global South responses from Cambodia, or the, the way that children, for example, in Sierra Leone or Uganda, or Uganda are rehabilitated and cleansed and healed and yeah. addressed by the group. Do you see these crossing all these practices coming into uh, our space here in the West when we respond? to sort of mental health for traumatized populations? Well, so, so I, should, yeah. I think I should start by saying that um, in, in the book, first of all, so the answer ultimately is yes. I mean, in, in this book, we were careful to sort of get the opinions of local folks and not to write this book and say, These, here's some Stanford people who know what's better for you, but to actually collect the opinions of the people who were mental health practitioners and had been for many years, you know, 20 year history of doing mental health there. And and not only put their opinions in, but you know, there's a whole chapter in here that's really just, just a, a journalist piece where we took exactly what they said and made a chapter out of it. Um, and a lot of the practices that they use um, are influenced by, by Western practice, um, but a lot of it is that sort of hybridized. And so the other piece that I think we were very clear about when we recommended reparations was that the money didn't go to us to implement mental health. 
the money was um, would go to a local practitioner to, and we we written in our writing exactly what that would look like. Because I feel like that is beyond the scope of my uh, uh, knowledge, my practice is to tell someone in a different country how mental health should be delivered. Um, I have some ideas about how mental health is delivered in Cambodia just because I've, I've been working with that population here in California for 15 years and then also traveling to Cambodia for about 10 years and I know all, the, there's only 25 psychiatrists in Cambodia and I, I, I basically at this point know them all. And, and, but the answer to your question is many of them are influenced by Western ideas but, but all of them I would say have practiced a sort of hybrid and that was precisely what we had hoped that this money would go toward, not some artificially Western <coughs> branded uh, version of money uh, <coughs> delivery. And, but I feel like we sort of stepped out at the point where, where that reparation was suggested. And the rest of it is kind of up to that process. I think a similar thing would be true in the Central African Republic. Let's suppose that this became a guilty verdict and they chose to offer reparations. And they came to our lab and said, how should this money be spent? We would basically say, with respect, we, we can't answer that question. We, I don't know how, how monies are best spent for mental health in the Central African Republic. It'll be interesting, I think, to see if the ICC um, ad adopts any approach similar to what they did at the ECCC in Cambodia with actually getting um, suggestions for reparations, mm -hmm. because they didn't just come from expert reports, right? The civil party participation process in Cambodia yeah. meant that the civil parties themselves, yeah. some better represented than others, got to brainstorm their own ideas for what types of reparations would you like? And in case 001, the first case case against Comrade Doig, it was an incredibly diverse, creative uh, list of requests, many of which got denied because the court initially was saying, well, we can't order the government to do anything, and we don't have any money, and so blah. And, but then in case 2-1, people basically fundraised. Um, you know, nonprofits, organizations fundraised to pre-fund um, mm -hmm. any reparations requests, and the court granted all of the ones that had secured funding, basically. So um, so it's a creative process, it was an interesting process, and it did mean, um, at least in the cases of the civil party groups that had Better, were better represented by sort of good lawyers, um, that there was some, some interesting um, voices heard, I think, and some interesting approaches that weren't just about money for therapy or something, you know. Last question. Great. Um, so as mental health harm is a global issue, what kind of international justice processes the judge looks like they're going to do? I'm wondering whether and how we can minimize re-traumatization of victims as they participate in these processes. I'm asking because, kind of in my own experience as a human rights lawyer representing asylum seekers, I realized I have very little practical guidance about how to go about eliciting the information I needed to build a case for my client while minimizing the harms I was doing to them. And you find yourself in a situation where you're asking people about the worst day of their life. Over and over again. Over and over again. And then making decisions like, okay, how badly do I need to know how many men can rape this woman in order to win her case? Where's the trade off? So I think as a field, we probably need to do a little more systemic thinking about this. And I'm wondering what any of you might have to say. This is, this is one of the reasons I got so excited about the lab when we started talking about what we could do, because there's sort of a, somewhat of a direct service element, just like in particular the asylum um, or the refugee resettlement cases. Um, and there's definitely sort of like, you know, one expert report here for this case, nature of the international criminal law um, reports. But we thought, you know, there's a there's a higher level contribution that the lab could make by being at the center of these different processes that have this common thread. Um, and and that is figuring out, you know, is there something we could do to amass a lot of this information into a, into one database or into a protocol or into mm -hmm. something that could be useful for say limiting the degree to which international criminal courts need to call dozens and dozens of witnesses to recount the same thing, or can we say, you know what, if you have testimony of the prevalence rate of PTSD in this community and you compare it to this, you have very good expert testimony. And you can, yeah, you can supplement it with a few people testifying who are, you know, not likely to be re-traumatized or sort of in a stronger place, um, rather than sort of having to amass a huge, um, a huge amount. Um, 
Yeah, so, and, and the idea of, of protocols is also, um, what, can, what insights can we glean from this work with, um, with the refugee resettlement cases that might help people who are sort of primary responders um, understand better how to identify prospective cases, not you know harm them further, and channel them into the right places to get help. Um, so, so we're thinking as a lab of the other kinds of outputs that we could produce beyond just sort of we do these cases, we produce these reports, you know, um, sort of work. I think the only other comment that I would have is that I think that your experience if you've done asylum cases is the worst one. The other ones are all better than that one. Well, that's that, my rich trip, you know, actually. <laughs> well, but, but asylum cases, it, basically, they are ultimately their deportation hearings. And so the, 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 the idea is that, the, that they are being deported from the country, and then attorneys are arguing that they shouldn't be. So they have to prove that they, that they have asylum rather than the other way around. So not only do they have to recount their story, but they can get cross-examined, which is really unfortunate. I mean, there's no way to not traumatize somebody. In fact, I think some of the government attorneys are very good at uh, traumatizing people in those instances to get them unfocused and to get them to, to be disorganized in their testimony. Yeah, I mean, my experience is actually in the affirmative cases, which are a little less explicitly uh -huh. oh, yeah. antagonistic, but I still think that it's true. Because in, in the humanitarian parole cases, while we did have to get that information from them and had to take them through some of this stuff, they didn't have to show up in court. The attorneys yeah. went to the immigration courts and won the cases and got them paroled. So, I mean, that was a completely different experience than anything I've ever done with asylum. Well, I want to thank you for your yeah, questions question. and comments. But I particularly, particularly want to thank our panelists for an informative and inspirational session.